Hello and welcome. I'm Heather Hodges, the Executive Director of the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. The corridor is a federal national heritage area established by an act of Congress in 2006 to recognize the unique contributions of the Gullah Geechee people who have traditionally lived in the coastal areas and on the sea islands of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, from Pender County, North Carolina, to St. John's County, Florida. All across the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor today, you'll find historic and vibrant Gullah Geechee communities, and we encourage you to visit them, as well as one of our many heritage sites, to learn more about this rich history and culture. We also encourage you to attend one of the many educational programs that we offer year-round across the corridor, programs like the one that you're going to view today. We hope that you'll walk away from this program with a deeper understanding of the historic experience of enslaved Africans in colonial South Carolina. After the program is finished, we hope that you'll visit our website and subscribe to our newsletter so that you can be kept up to date on all of our upcoming events and programs. Last, I'd like to thank our colleagues at the Clemson University and College of Charleston Graduate Program in Historic Preservation and the Charleston County Public Library for collaborating with us to bring you this program today. I also thank you for your enduring interest in learning more about the history and culture of the Gullah Geechee people, and I look forward to meeting you in the corridor one day soon. Hello, my name is John Marcou, and I'm the director of the Clemson College of Charleston Graduate Program in Historic Preservation. I'm also an archaeologist and a professor of anthropology. And I'm Corey Hayward, Wexler Curatorial Fellow and archaeologist at Drayton Hall. And John and I would like to share with you guys today some of the research that we've been doing for the past year on Kelowna ware. Kelowna ware is a type of pottery that was made by Native Americans and enslaved Africans and their descendants beginning in colonial America and into the 19th century. This ceramic type is found at nearly all historic sites in the U.S. and the appearance of the vessels vary greatly depending on where it was made. For example, Kelowna ware in Virginia is found at sites more greatly associated with Native American groups. But down here in South Carolina, most Kelowna ware was recovered archaeologically from sites inhabited by enslaved Africans and African Americans. Kelowna ware is a unique and important artifact type because it shows influences from multiple cultural groups. During the colonial period, Europeans forced Africans and Native Americans together and as interactions increased between all three of these groups, they inevitably exchanged ideas, and in this case, pottery making traditions. Not only can we see the changes in ways colonial ware pots were made, but new vessel forms previously unseen in both African and Native American traditions also were made in order to cater to a more European market. Archaeologists use the term colonial ware to describe this type of pottery to reflect the fact that it is a product of colonialism. Kelowna ware pottery would not be made if it were not for the colonial project of Europeans in North America. One of the questions that archaeologists are really engaged with is trying to look at Kelowna ware as a marker of the identities that are being created during the colonial period, especially among the makers of this pottery which is primarily enslaved Africans and Native Americans. I'd like to, for the next couple minutes, talk about the potting traditions of local Native Americans, because as part of our project, archaeologists like to look backward to see where the traditions came from that might be contributing to the colonial where we find in the 18th and 19th centuries. So we can begin by thinking about the archaeological finds made around the Charleston Harbor that reflect life of Native American communities in the 16th and 17th centuries, just prior to and during the first few decades of European colonialism in the area. Archaeologists refer to this period as the Ashley period, and it runs from approximately A.D. 1550 to 1700 or so. In this map, we can see the locations of some of the archaeological sites where we find pottery from Native American communities dating to this period. And generally, the presence of this pottery at these sites reflects either 
interactions between a European settlement, such as the Lord Ashley site, or Drayton Hall, the interaction between the Europeans living there and Native Americans who were either trading at the site or were enslaved at the site. Uh, the other types of sites we find are the actual villages where Native Americans live during this period. And as you can see, there's not a, uh, a ton of archeological sites. Um, part of this is the fact that they were relatively small and another part is that it, this was not a very populous region when the Europeans arrived. When we think about the pottery styles that Native American groups made during this time period, we refer to a larger potting tradition that was practiced by many Native American groups in the region. Archaeologists refer to this archaeological uh, manifestation of potting traditions as the Lamar culture which as you can see in the map spanned all the way from uh, North Carolina to Eastern Alabama, uh, South to Northwestern Florida, uh, and even crept into East Tennessee a little bit. Um, this is not the equivalent of what we would think of as a modern tribe. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of cultural variability in it among groups in this culture area, the Lamar culture, but they did share a very similar potting tradition that had very distinctive decorations and vessel forms. Generally, the Ashley period potters decorated their pottery in a couple of different ways. The primary method of decoration that was used involved uh, carved wooden paddles. So the potter would take a sharp implement, most likely made of stone, and would carve complex decorations, either curving lines or intersecting straight lines into the paddle. And then as the potter constructed the vessel uh, by usually taking coils of clay and winding them around and then taking a paddle and some sort of usually a rock or even the, their hand on the inside of the vessel in order to weld or anneal those coils together. At the very end of forming the pot, they could impress the pot with this carved wooden paddle to leave uh, intricate stamped impressions. Potters also would take sharp instruments and uh, draw in the sides of vessels. Now this would be when the vessels are wet, of course, and this is called incising. And these are the two primary forms of decoration in what we would think of as Ashley period pottery assemblages. Intricate designs could include curvilinear designs like concentric circles or bullseyes or sort of sweeping scrolls, figure eights or nines, as well as zigzagging rectilinear shapes, straight lines, or um, what we would call line block, which are intersecting at right angle lines. Potters would also decorate the rims of vessels with by punctating or poking the rim with a hollow reed, or sometimes they would attach a strip of clay uh, to the rim and then notch it with a stick, leaving a very sort of uh, a nice uh, decoration along the lip of the vessel. One of the interesting things when you look at these decorative motifs is that uh, they look very little like Kelowna ware that's found on low country sites on the plantations. They, Kelowna ware is never really stamped like these vessels. Very rarely is it incised with anything more than um, a couple of lines, usually intersecting lines. And the vessel forms also of Kelowna ware on 18th century plantations do not really mimic the forms that we typically find on early uh, Native American sites, sites dating to the late 17th and early 18th centuries. Kelowna ware bowls tend to be relatively shallow, uh, whereas the Native American bowls tend to be relatively deep. The jars on Native American uh, Native American villages tend to be opened, meaning they don't really have a tight constriction or a mouth at any one time. They almost are like very deep 
bowls with uh, excurvate rims, whereas Kelowna ware jars tend to have a, def a definite, uh, what we would call a mouth on them or a constriction where the vessel comes into a narrow spot and then opens back up to the rim. Uh, so this, again, is a, a very interesting indication of that colonial influence. So colonial wear really is, in its true sense, a colonial piece of material culture. It, you can think of it as springing out of the interaction of these different cultural groups of Europeans, enslaved Africans, and, and enslaved and free Native Americans that this, it, you can think of it as what anthropologists would call ethnogenesis or the creation of a new cultural practice out of constituent practices, meaning the potting traditions of enslaved Africans and of Native Americans came together to create this new form, which becomes very common. Uh, it becomes a very common part of the, the tools and the daily lives of enslaved people on these plantations. Because Kelowna ware was made by marginalized groups during the colonial period, we have nearly no documentary evidence to help us research who was making Kelowna ware, how they were doing this, and why. Unlike with European and European-American ceramics, the production of which was heavily documented, Kelowna ware is still kind of a mystery. Therefore, in order to understand how and why Kelowna ware was made, we as archaeologists look at the different physical attributes or characteristics that make up a pottery vessel. For example, we study things like the types of clay used and how potters cleaned and prepared this clay. We also look at how the vessel was formed, whether it was made by coiling or slab building, what kind of shape or form the potter wanted, and of course the various surface treatments and decorations. All of these attributes represent a specific choice made by the potter, and that is essentially what we are trying to understand, the human behind the artifact. While in most cases it is difficult to determine the ethnicity of a potter based off of the physical characteristics of a vessel alone, my colleagues and I have identified a handful of colonial wear shirts that bear a rare and specific type of surface decoration with direct ties to West and Northern Central Africa. About a year ago, Martha Zierden from the Charleston Museum got in touch with John and me about four shirts with an impression that none of us had seen before. These were from the Hayward Washington House located on Church Street in downtown Charleston and all of these shirts appeared to have been broken from the same vessel. It was soon after that I realized Drayton Hall's collection contained nine very similar shirts, all from a well feature that had been used as a trash pit. Similarly, these all seemed to have come from the same vessel, and they had the same unidentified impression. Finally, just a couple months ago, while John and I were in Conway for the International Gullah Geechee in African Diaspora Conference, we came across a large colonial ware pot in the Ori County Museum that had the same impression. The impression visible on all of these vessels consists of Z-shaped grooves resulting in repeating asymmetrical diamond-like shapes in relief. While the three vessels we have identified are not exactly identical, some have larger impressions or the clay appeared more wet at the time of decoration, they seem to have been made using the same technique. After some digging, John figured out that the impressions were made using a technique called rouletting. A roulette can be any object that is rolled across the surface of a pot, thus creating a repeating pattern. It was a fairly common decorative technique, having been used in many different pottery decorating traditions through time, including today. John was able to identify the particular type of roulette used on the Kelowna wear shirts. This is called a folded strip roulette a pottery decorating tool that has been used in West and Northern Central Africa for over 2,000 years. A folded strip roulette is characterized by two or more flexible strips of material, usually something vegetal, I used palm fronds here, and these strips are twisted and folded together, kind of like a lanyard, in order to create a three-sided tool. 
Then, when this tool is rolled across the surface of a vessel, it creates the same asymmetrical diamond-like shapes that repeat every third row. In fact, we can see that repeating pattern on the Kelowna Wear shirts found at sites in Charleston. The distance between each third impression is consistent. This makes it unlikely that these shirts were impressed with fabric or a net, which would have created more inconsistent impressions. John discovered a lot of previous archaeological and ethnographic studies in West and Northern Central Africa on folded strip roulettes, and the descriptions from these sources helped us replicate the tool and understand the steps that went into producing this decoration. Not only were these sources important for us identifying the impressions on these Kelowna wear shirts and how they were made, but they were also important for us understanding the context and history behind folded strip rouletting. When we think about any possible connection of the rouletted specimens of pottery we recovered with potential African potting traditions, we rely on the work of archaeologists that have been researching groups in West and West Central Africa for the past 30 or 40 years or so. And we are very lucky in that in the last 10 years, a number of publications have come out that really document in detail the types of rouletted pottery that African potters ha are making currently and have been making for the last thousand years or so. So we rely heavily on the images and the ethnographic examples that are provided by these researchers. This research identifies a number of different types of rouletted designs that African potters in West and West Central Africa were making. The roulettes typically include roulettes either made of fiber of some sort, whether it's twined uh, rope or cordage, or uh, plated sort of uh, vegetable matter like a palm frond, or they're carved wooden roulettes. And in these images, you can see uh, examples from modern potters. Uh, on the right is the example of the roulette that's actually used. And on the left is an example of the impression that's left by that roulette after you roll it over the surface of the clay. And so you can see there's a, a variety of, of either carved wooden, there's even a, a shell that's used in one case. And then the fiber roulettes tend to be either braided or folded in some sort of way. The left side in the center looks as close to the type of roulette that we've recovered from the Charleston context. Research by Africanist archaeologist Alexander Livingstone Smith has charted the distribution of these different types of roulettes across different groups in Africa, both archaeologically and in the present, what we call ethnographically. And most of the potting tradition seems to be confined to the area that we know as the Sahel, uh, running all the way from the Atlantic coast to the area around Lake Chad. And what you can see here is a relatively, nowadays anyway, a relatively discrete or different distribution of roulettes made of fiber, which are is the darker gray, and then carved wooden roulettes, which tends to be, uh, which is the represented as the lighter color in this map. Looking back through time, archaeologically, this map shows the distribution of the different types, the fiber and the carved wooden roulettes across that same area in the last thousand years. And what we can see is that the distribution was much less discrete. There was a lot more mixing. A lot more of the communities were, potters in the communities were actually using both fiber and carved wooden roulettes. One area, or two areas actually, to sort of keep in mind are the northwestern uh, area of the shaded zone as well as the southeastern around Lake Chad. These are two areas that largely were 
uh, limited to just fiber roulettes, and this actually plays into two uh, potential sources of the potting tradition that made the kind of roulette that we've recovered in the Low Country. Corey and I have looked at the literature of archaeologists working in West and West Central Africa and created this map showing the distribution of the particular type of roulette that we've recovered, which is known as a folded strip roulette, which is, a, of course, a very diagnostic type of rouletting. And by mining the, the work of other folks, the literature, we've identified a few kind of hot spots in West and West Central Africa where we see this type of rouletting. And we can see that if we look at current within the last hundred years or so, African potters in Senegal, Nigeria, Niger, Chad, and Sudan are still making pottery decorated with this type of roulette. And if we go back in time and look at archaeological context stretching from the last 2,000 years or so, we see this type of rouletting used in uh, Mauritania and Mali, uh, Niger, and Nigeria. And within this area, there's actually two really good candidates for potential sources of the potting tradition that may have ended up in the low country. Uh, both of these areas were involved in the Atlantic slave trade during the 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries. The first area that is a candidate for the source of the potting tradition uh, lies along the western shore of Lake Chad, during the last thousand years or so, this area is part of what is known as the Kanem-Borno Empire. Uh, these were Islamic Kanuri speaking Africans that controlled a large portion of that central western side of, of Lake Chad. And one of their main uh, sources of income was uh, enslaving and selling people from groups living to the south of Lake Chad. Two archaeological sites that have been excavated in recent years contain deposits that date to the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, and these sites are associated with the Kanem-Borno Empire. Uh, the site in, to the north, Gaurumele, uh, is thought to actually have been the capital of the Kanem-Borno Empire for uh, for a brief period during this time. Uh, this is not to say that these sites are where the potential potter making the pottery in the Low Country could have been, in fact, could have been from, in fact, potters from all over the Kanem-Borno Empire most likely made pottery bearing this surface treatment. Another area that is a potential source of the folded strip roulette potting tradition uh, lies about 400 kilometers to the west of Lake Chad. And this is an area that was settled by a different ethnic group of, of Africans uh, who spoke the Hausa language. And the site of Kufan Kanawa is another recently excavated site that contains deposits from the right time period that would match up with the pottery that we've recovered in low country context. And potters in this region also made folded strip roulettes. Of course, we can never be sure the exact location of where the potter potters that made these vessels were from. Uh, we can only provide case scenarios, potentials, uh, of where the, these potters may have come from. There is a lot of historical research that has yet to be done to demonstrate that we have potters from these groups. Uh, typically, we think of enslaved Africans coming from along the coast uh, because this is where the historical record typically picks up. And we don't have a lot of historical documentation of the enslavement of people from much further east, even though it does uh, the slave trade did involve large numbers of people 
uh, from this region. So in the future, archaeologists like my colleagues, Corey and, and others and myself, will need to really delve into the historic records that we have to try to see if there's additional evidence for this connection between the Low Country and these groups living around Lake Chad in West Central Africa. Of course, we have a lot more research to do with Rouletting and Kolonaware as a whole. But one of our goals with this workshop was to bring this research out of the archaeology lab and to the Charleston community to get your thoughts. We also were planning on letting you try your own hand at making a roulette. I'm showing the full video here of me making a roulette in case anyone wants to try it. It is fairly simple. All you need are palm fronds. The key is to make sure that the strips don't fold into a crease. Instead, they need to create a cavity that will essentially result in that diamond-like shape in relief on the clay. I found that the thinner the strip, the easier it was to manipulate. In archaeology, we call this experimental archaeology, essentially attempting to replicate the processes or human behavior that resulted in the artifact or any other evidence appearing the way it does. With this particular study, it helped us understand the choices and skills that went into decorating the three vessels from Drayton Hall, the Hayward Washington House, and the Horry County Museum. For example, we learned that you can reuse a roulette over and over, but the impression it creates will appear slightly different because the way the vegetal materials dry out over time. So this kind of experiment, as well as understanding the full context of folded strip rouletting, helped us realize the importance of finding an African potting tradition something very distinguishable from both Native American and European traditions retained in colonial America. John and I want to thank everyone for watching today. Like I said, we want to hear from you, any thoughts or questions that you may have. So please send them our way and thanks again.